Greetings. I'm Josh Tyson, co-author of Age of Invisible Machines, the first best-selling book about conversational AI. Age of Invisible Machines explores the learnings of industry veteran and OneReach.ai CEO Rob Wilson. Each week, Rob and I bring in a guest to continue the conversations we started in the pages of our book. This week on the Invisible Machines podcast, we're talking about the limited role that LLMs actually play in creating advanced digital assistance, how to create a knowledge base that unlocks all of the unstructured data within an organization, and why forging a shared vision is critical for teams to succeed with conversational AI. Basically, we're debunking the idea that you could just feed a bunch of documents to a large language model and take off running. Our guests this week are Jeff McMillan and David Wu of Morgan Stanley. As the head of AI and the head of knowledge management and generative AI respectively, Jeff and David led the creation of an intelligent digital assistant for the global investment firm's advisors. Partnering with OpenAI months before ChatGPT was released, Morgan Stanley was able to rebuild their existing content models using generative AI and relational databases. This has changed the way their advisors work, giving them easy access to the best information within the organization and letting them spend more time in conversation with their customers. There is a wealth of practical information in this episode, so let's jump right into this discussion with Jeff McMillan and David Wu of Morgan Stanley. Invisible Machines is produced in partnership with OneReach.ai. Their Generative Studio X platform is the only orchestration platform that's been named a leader by every major analyst group. Enterprises and other organizations are already using GSX to create technology ecosystems where they can grow their own digital teammates called intelligent digital workers. These IDWs can be set to work with hundreds of customizable skills utilizing GSX's no-code building tools. Head to OneReach.ai to test drive an IDW and experience the next phase of generative AI. All right. Well, thanks again for uh, returning to the podcast, Jeff. It's, it's great to have you back. Great to be here. And David, wonderful to have you joining us as well. Nice to see you guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Jeff, last time you were here, we, we talked a bit about the uh, the nine-month process of, of Morgan Stanley training uh, an open AI GPT model on, I think it was 100 thousand internal documents. Uh, we're seeing lots of companies trying to create more advanced chatbots, either you know by feeding documents to LLMs or maybe feeding them into a vector database or some combination of both. Uh, we thought it might be interesting to to hear about you know some of the challenges that you encountered on your project and then also maybe talk about some of the opportunities that you identified uh, you know that you're pushing towards with automation in the future. You know, I want to start by saying when we chose our initial use case, which was essentially, you know, we, we call it chatbots. I think that does a disservice to what this technology does. I really do think it's an intelligent assistant. Uh, when we when we posed that uh, idea, it was more about, you know, learning and how to drive engagement and education and socialization of these capabilities. So at the time, our focus was not you know, a, a very rich KPI approach, which, you know, candidly we do in most things. Our primary goal was to get these large language models in and 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 learn. Um, now that we're in it, uh, we made a good choice because what we have found is that access information in 2024 outside of LLMs is quite poor, right? We search for the name of a company, we get six links, we try to go in and out. We try to find the thing that we want. Um, we're not always sure that we found the accurate information. Um, and we go back and forth. And what we're seeing is there's a lot of what I'm going to call, you know, it's just wasted time in our day. So everyone's talking about the you know, grave new world where we're going to do these new products and services. Well, let's first go after all of the all of the dead space that exists in our in our lives. And we, in, in the process of doing this work, we saw two things. One is there's a lot of dead space. And two, we have all this intellectual capital, hundred thousands of documents, millions of concepts, but people are not accessing them. 
for the benefit of their practices and their clients because there's too much friction. And to be able right. to answer six questions in a in a six minute conversation using the OLS tool is not possible. So, you know, we believe that one of our differentiated capabilities here are really two things. It's it's our employees, our financial advisors in the case of wealth, and it's the it's the intellectual capital that supports them. But if those people can't get access to it, then the value proposition isn't there. Right. So what we're seeing is this is really about unleashing knowledge and you know I, I say this all the time in some ways as the guy who runs AI that that hopefully this is going to create more capacity for our financial advisors to do what they really right. should be doing more of which is talking and engaging and solving problems yeah and we see this a lot we see, there's sort of a loop there right which is the like a negative downward spiral loop that's you're producing content that nobody's reading so you stop caring about the content you're producing because you're not getting any feedback, negative or positive. So the quality of what you're producing is bad. So then when people can finally find the thing they're looking for, it's not very useful because people aren't using it. And so they're not investing in it. And so it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that if it's not easy to retrieve it, right, in the old days with the with the old products, right, then then the quality gets worse of you know in terms of the the documents and the, and the knowledge and and the curation of it and then it's then it's just this downward spiral of, of of none of it is very good and now we're in this place where wait now potentially it's plausible to make use of it and a lot of companies have this let's say poor knowledge data that they're trying to retrieve from and you guys kind of address that head on, like the quality of the knowledge became the second problem once retrieval yeah. was. Well, and why don't we, hey, David, um, you know, because David, uh, when he, you know, we started working together over five years ago, you know, we saw that um, one of them, one of the lowest ranked uh, platforms was our, our content platform. And, you know, I give David a lot of credit, his team, and how they approach that. So David, when I hand one over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. And Rob, as you were describing this cycle, this almost doom yeah. loop, it's, it's, it's yeah. almost like, it's almost like, man, were you here in 2018? Cause you, you, you described exactly what we were dealing with. I'd be shocked if you weren't just secretly a Morgan Stanley employee <laughs> because we were absolutely in the doom loop. You had a situation where people weren't using the content cause they couldn't find the content, right? Yeah. And yeah. therefore, people stopped caring when they saw they weren't getting the type of traffic that they were looking for. So the world back at the time when we had such a low-rated content platform is you had roughly 60,000 documents on just our internet alone. And now it's down to about 20,000 right. or so. You had cases where people couldn't find stuff. They found a lot yeah. of duplicate information, right? They saw some 2012 procedure also next to a 2014 procedure in terms of how do you open a particular type of account right they didn't they didn't know necessarily which one was the right one some pieces had what were the accurate information some aspect of 2014 did not and a big part of that was because there was no ownership right we found as we were going through the problem set that many times you had some summer analysts come in they spend 10 weeks here they, they're assigned with publishing their team's procedure or, or overview document. Well, what happens at the end of summer? They leave and no one remembers that it was there, right? Right. It's, yeah, it mucks 100%. Up and, yeah, it mucks up the search engine, right? Yeah. And then you're yeah, sending- Yeah, a lot of people don't realize like the, the examples we had of good search engines or decent search engines are like Wikipedia and Google. And they forget the amount of money that's spent on- keyword yes. adding keywords to web pages and curating and making it findable we we have experts that that learn and are trained to to make content and we pay them a lot of money to make it searchable the same with wikipedia we have volunteers i, I think on average it's like four hundred dollars to create a wikipedia page because of the am amount of expertise required in making it findable and then you got thousands of documents that no one spent a dime making it findable on 
That's exactly right. So the first thing we realized is, well, we got to find out who are the right owners of this thing, right? So we right. broke up all of our content into domains, got about 100 or nice. so domains. And we said, okay, we need an officer level, like a so, vice president. So you guys or, ended up with like 100 domains, which is good. It's manageable. It's manageable. Yeah. And we had to say, guys, like someone's got to be accountable, an officer level for each of these domains. And how did you create that ontology? Like, I, you know, that was that just looking at the content or did you just sort of look at the business from the top down and say, what are the domains that make sense versus like trying to read all of these documents and classify yeah. them? You know, it's 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 an art. That's why ontology and taxonomies have always been tricky. Yeah. It's a mixed approach. We looked at the content. We spoke with some teams, right? Okay. And we kind of try to find a feasible middle ground. Because if you get very church and state on this, you, you can build a beautiful ontology that d- people don't want to support. Or you yeah. can build a very like business oriented one that's really hard to determine yeah. the topics, right? Yeah. So we, we ended up into a nice middle ground. And we found an individual accountable for each of these groups. And we said, folks, we've got 60,000 documents. We built out spreadsheets for every single domain and say, tell me which of these you want to keep and which you want to throw away. And there were obvious things in there. There were like duplicates. There was documents from 10 years ago. Very easy, quick, 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 quick throwaways. Right. And then we subsequently came back and we said, later step, well, if you want to keep them, you got to apply new metadata labels to this, right? And we spent a bunch of time with a subset, almost like a steering committee out of these domains to come up with other labels. We made, we, we, the hand-to-hand combat, Rob, we went to everybody and said, keep the, the ones that you want to keep, re-tag them and yep. have this much time and we're going to keep checking in on them. Yep. That 60,000 became 20,000, which is nice. kind of a sweet spot we have today. Yeah. But that's just, that's just solving the symptoms. You got to go back and solve the core problems so what we said is, okay, how do we not get ourselves into this boat again? We created a set of standards, right? We created a set of standards in terms of how you write and how you tag the content. We made everyone go through the training if they wanted access to publish, and we turned off the automated publishing. So now, Got instead it. of it, you, you type something, it shows up on the internet, there's yep. now a team that we developed um, and the team's job is to review that against a set right. of... So this is like actual. your own internal Wikipedia model. You have yes. folks yes. that are curating the data to make sure it's going to be findable and then training and teaching the folks that author the content to consider findability as they're authoring, which is which is huge, right? Um, that's that's exactly right. And Rob, the, the, the other key was we, we built up a really good team overseas and when things come into, I'm just gonna give you an example. I have the checklist in front of me. So now that we have over 60 plus things that we review a piece of Ooh, nice. content against, I'll take you in the metadata. Is there a typo in the SEO and the search label, right? Instead of banking, did you type in baking, right? Uh-huh. Did you put in an author name? That's not even the firm wide directory, right? Did you put, did you put in a classification that doesn't make any sense with what you're saying. For example, it seems to be about banking, but instead you made it about alts. Did you just accidentally hit the wrong drop down? Did you fat finger these things? Um, we also looked into, are you organizing a content? Is it just a long run on paragraph blob or are you breaking it down with bullets and into sections that make it a little bit more readable and scannable? Right. Because what, what we heard is, no one reads the whole thing in the end. They just get into a page. They want to quickly scan, is this the right page? And you got to actually help people organize and, and, and how to do that. And the underlying premise is most of these people are not writers. So we actually have to right. give them some basic education on how you do this. Um, but it helps a lot with just the quality of the content. Yeah. The thing that this has proven, and by the way, we did not do this for Gen AI. That was not our driver. Our driver was we had low adoption and high dissatisfaction. But what when you start to create these structural, consistent structural um, components within your within your content, it really lends itself to Gen AI. Gen AI does not right. do well on randomness. It does much better the more structure you have. And I would right. argue for all the great work that the team has done with LLMs and OpenAI, which is you know they're they're magnificent. The single differentiator is what David's talking about here. Yeah, garbage yeah, in, that, garbage out. That sort out. of leads. Absolutely. 
Oh, uh, that that feeds into what I was actually going to ask. I, I was curious if if this process has made it kind of easier to manage some of the peculiarities associated with large language models, like their propensity for hallucinating or presenting old information as if it were new or saying it doesn't have an answer when it actually does. Like has this kind of hands-on uh, approach where everyone's kind of better trained on the processes helped with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the most important thing we did to manage hallucination, Josh, is we grounded all of our answers have to come from this 100,000 documents. And you can control this based on what you instruct GPT, right? And my our goal, Jeff and I's goal is we're not trying to solve every question in the universe. We just want to get the right information from our 100,000 documents that have gone through this curation process, yeah. right? And yeah. for the things that we don't, we just want to say, I don't know, but put it aside. And we're even having conversations now with who we think the right author is like, hey, Rob, for example, if you're the author of this particular domain, there seems to be a lot of questions in this domain. Do you want to consider writing something up? Because if you do, yes. you follow yes. our standards, it can be retrievable in a matter of right. minutes. And the system itself can handle that. It can get the feedback. It can prompt a person. And it becomes like a, a, a self-sustaining system which it's like using gen AI or conversational AI to, to feed itself. That's when it's self-learning in a sense, right? It's, it's human in the loop self-learning, but that's when it sort of hits that critical moment of, of self-sustainability. And it's saying, hey, I'm getting a lot of questions around this or thumbs down feedback on these answers. Um, do you want to, you know, readdress this? Um, we've also seen uh, an interesting thing um, uh, you know, sort of feedback loop around time to live on knowledge. Um, that's something that we uh, kind of advocate for, which is as you put knowledge in, I think it's be one of your 60, it might even be, right, where all knowledge has an expiration date like a milk on a carton and it just verifies with the domain owner on a regular basis, like, is this still relevant? Is this still yes. the right answer? Um because all knowledge does have an expiration date, or at least a date you should check if it's still healthy. And some some knowledge can can be you know annual or or even biannual, and some should be monthly. Um, and so having that like TTL component, um, we've found to be hugely valuable because you don't you don't always get that feedback. You know, sometimes you just need the domain owner to review. And be like, yep, yeah, this all well, looks good still. We actually put, uh, by the way, you have a much better name than we did. We had an expiration date we just put on it. And that when okay. that expiration date comes, you as the author are notified that your piece of content is up for expiration. And you have nice. to revalidate it. And guess what? If you don't, we, it, it gets pulled down. Nice. And that's maximum one year. That's that's super, max one year. That's super interesting that you pull it down like that's, that's right. I think we that's a big deal, right? Because is, is it a hallucination or is it the right data for the document, but the wrong data for the time? In other words, well, that's, the system was that's right. That's right. And we and by the way, when things go wrong, there's a million, you know, everyone's very focused on hallucinations. We don't really, it doesn't really, in the way that, you know, normal definition. Um, but when things go wrong, sometimes it's, by the way, sometimes the person doesn't ask the question properly. Sometimes we yep. misunderstand the question. Sometimes the underlying content isn't right. Um, sometimes there there actually could be conflicting views in the system. So yeah. all of that stuff contributes to quote unquote perception of something wrong. And what our prompt engineers will talk about this. What they do is they take that problem and they try to figure out what went wrong, and then we pull the right lever to fix it. Got it. I've seen a lot of issues um, as you try to make it more conversational. So the Q and A pattern of like to turn right question answer is relatively uh easy like you said to constrain it to the subject matter but as you start to get into multi-turn um the the primer if you're if you're loading that history in as well as the content and trying to take it into context so you're like hey you know do we have an office and blah 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 yes we do and, you know are they open on sundays great um where you're not like rephrasing the question, is the office in blah, 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 open on Sundays because you're you're trying to use that history. Over time, that history can kind of pollute the LLM 
and yep. cause it to hallucinate. Um, how do you guys address that? That like, do you just limit the history or limit the number of turns or you limit do. the size of the question? Yeah, we all limit, of the above. We, Rob, we yeah, great question. We limit the number of turns because right now, like, the, like you said it perfectly. The more turns, the more you you introduce a chance of confusing the model, right? Yeah. And then particularly, like, there's people that will if you don't limit the turns, they'll t- turn and turn and turn for. Ever. You know, you you're right. early on some examples, people use Bing GPD for four hours and just talk to it and think of that every yeah. one more turn. We saw this in the Air Canada mistake. example where they yeah. got sued, right? Because they let too many turns go and that allowed them to reprime the model, the user to reprime the model into saying, you know, things that they wanted it to say because they because they put too much history in there. How do you guys approach that? How, how do you limit it? Is it just like, hey, you know, how can I help you with something else or? Essentially, yeah. Essentially, yeah. We, we find for the most part, folks, we're focused on getting people the right answer the first time. So you don't have to go and create that second turn. Got right? it. And, okay. and I think that's been the most important thing. And then we, we coach them just continue to write the question with as much detail as possible. Right. Because even if you had that more and more turns, what ends up happening is sometimes folks give you less and less information with each subsequent turn, which right. makes it a little even harder to yes. figure out what you want. Yeah. Yeah. And we saw an interesting stat when we looked at the highest users of the of the intelligent assistant, it was absolutely the people that had the most expansive questions to start. Got so it. the person that comes in and says IBM or IRA, <laughs> yep. um, that doesn't give you good answers. Right, we found as we were looking through the data that the most pervasive users of this actually learned how to interact with the system. They were, their questions were deeper, more specific, more easy for any human being to understand what they wanted. Yeah. Versus the people that didn't use it as much, maybe like dabbled in, were giving us very IRA, four hundred one k, right levels of of questions that yes. honestly, like none of us would really understand what they wanted. Yeah, I did a project um, for LexisNexis a, a long time ago to to basically rebuild their entire search engine capabilities. And for those who don't know what LexisNexis is, it's the search engine a lot of legal entities use to find case law. To, so it's really critical. You know, if you find case law, it could be the difference between winning or losing a case, right? Because common law is like a big part of how, you know, uh, judges make decisions and, and laws are, are, are created. Um, it's not, they're not all explicitly created. So, but what we found when we did our user research is that there were people, it wasn't that the system, um, was, was the, the key metric for whether you were good or bad at, at finding case law. Um, but that the biggest factor was the person searching and there were people that were just really good at finding case law because they knew the system. And if you looked at what they did, it's to your exact point. They were really good at constructing the query, essentially the question. They understood innately how the system works and created the the right kinds of questions to get them the answers. And, and you think, okay, that's more important than the system itself is the is how you construct the query. And like you said, you guys saw the same thing, it seems like. 100%. Well, that, that becomes kind of a, like a discoverability issue, I suppose, and it would affect adoption as well. Like you, you need, you don't want users to just stare at a blank box and, and start making requests. It, it behooves, I suppose, uh, the organization to prompt them and to, I guess, teach yeah. the prompters how to prompt a little bit. Is there an element of that built into the, to the automation as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's a lot of coaching that we've done around this. We continue to put educational videos around this. We're build developing within our screens right now more examples of what good looks like, right? And we want to, over time, continue to circulate, hey, here are the top really well-constructed questions and just keep reinforcing this. But I think this is just a big behavioral change, Josh, because if you look, I mean, the last 30 years have taught us keyword search through Google. Yes. Right? You almost got to like unpack that learning and get it yeah. to talk to a machine like you talk to your team member. And that's yep. not easy. Yeah. And yeah. I would go so far as saying, you know, we're, we're working at the firm wide level now. 
um, you know, we've got some 80,000 employees globally. You know, if, if I'm successful, every single one of them will have a basic introductory course on prompt engineering. And and then others will have level, you know, 201 and 301 and, and 401. But, the, but I really, you know, just like we learned Spanish or German or, or French, um, we're going to teach our kids how to prompt engineer because it's going to be the new language. Yeah, it's like teaching them to use a, a word processor, as we used to call it, you know, or a spreadsheet program. Like these become basic building blocks of just getting work done. Um, That's right. And yeah, prompt prompting will be probably easier than either of those two things, to be honest, to learn. Well, it is because if you know how to read and you know how to talk, you mm-hmm. can prompt. Yeah. And like it. it you know, you don't talk to a person by walking up to them and saying, coupon, right? right? <laughs> That's right. I mean, maybe <laughs> some of us do. Some, some of us do. We don't usually but... get the response we want, response we expect. <laughs> Does my kids do. Dinner. <laughs> what about like testing and feedback? Um, how does that factor into to operations? Yeah, as you, as you test, how do you test these things? Because I find that that with LLMs, it's made building so much faster it's made creating the system so much faster but it, my experience is it's made testing take so much longer yeah let me let me start and i'll let david answer the question but i would say you know we have found building llms or solutions llms are it's almost too easy right yeah um that's not the problem the number one challenge that firms face is that you, as an organization, and you know, David and I feel responsible for this, you have to put things into production that behave the way you intend them to behave. And whereas traditional technology is deterministic, right? You give me a business requirements document, I give these 13 features, I test those features work. AI can sometimes do things that you don't teach it to do. There are these unintended consequences. And, and as an organization, I think, we are all going to have to be able to establish a framework to evaluate. We actually have a whole team that's working on this, but David, it's, it's, I think it's really fascinating how it works. So why don't you take yeah. it through? Yeah, and, and I would just say, no, it takes a team effort because what we realized is we can get things out, but as you're tinkering to get things right, you need to bring in a whole bunch of people to help evaluate, right? So not just our team, because Jeff and I's team, we don't know the answer to every question. So right. when we were in the sandbox, like test environment, we built a simple little UI. It's nothing fancy. It's a screen. We had hundreds of people across our internal departments come in and just, we asked them, just type in whatever you want. But if you do, you have to rate the answer three to one, right? Three's the best, one's the worst. And for the ones that are two and one, tell us, did you like the answer? Was it accurate and complete, accurate and incomplete or accurate? And then not only that, but tell us the underlying links we gave you. Did we find the right page? Because these are two different problems. Find the right page versus you found the right page, but you gave a wrong answer. Yeah. In the case of the former, is more of a search and retrieval, vector search type of problem. In the case of the latter, it's a prompt engineering problem. You gave clear enough instruction yep. how to interpret this information. So so we did that. We, we got so much feedback, like tens of thousands of examples just in this simple sandbox environment we categorize these into like patterns of issues and then we came up with solutions for to solve each pattern but the smartest thing we did is we realized we need to create an answer key and this answer key we called a regression suite so we get did and we independently got about 500 questions the right answer where it came from then every time we make a tweak we'd rerun against the answer key because you want it to in a world where, where these things are to just point non deterministic you have to be careful that you're not fixing certain things, but breaking other things, right? Yes. Like, like I, I call it, and, and Jeff calls it bubble in the carpet, I call it the bubble in the screen protector, <laughs> right? That classic, you, you ever try to put on a screen protector, you fix one bubble, you create a few yeah. more. Yeah. yeah. Like that, that rigorous approach actually helped us a lot quickly yeah. get away from the wrong solutions and like double down on the right solutions. And then this is part of what we did in the nine months ahead of the pilot. Since we've gone to pilot, we simplified it a little bit at pilot and production. Now they don't have to do three, two, one. They just get a thumbs up, thumbs down with the comments. But it's, you know, what we did is we built a discipline, right? How do you do this that lives to this day, even though we're live? 
how did you create that answer key? Like, what's the, because, you know, it's the, the LLM sort of generating the answer. So it's, even if you ran it twice, you'd get two different like yeah. responses, even if the information's correct. What we did is we used a mix of both. So we had the LLM generate a bunch of things and then we sat down with uh-huh. the experts. So if it's a research question, we sit down with a research analyst or their team that covers that and say, hey, do Got you it. think this is right? Label it, yes, yep. put in the answer key. If it's not good, yep. tell me the right answer, put in the answer key. Got it. The um, So this is, I, I find this kind of interesting. Um, in, in the old in the old days, <laughs> which isn't that old, we're talking three, four years ago, it, you used to, um, it, it was more deterministic in sort of its approach where you would create a corpus of questions. You would train this NLU system with all the possible questions. You'd have a linguist sort of predict the ways people would ask for things. And then you would write the answer and and then people would use the system. And if they asked the question that you didn't have an answer for, you would add it to the corpus and that sometimes would confuse things and you'd have and so the LLM comes out and we're like, wow, this is like low shot training. Oh my God, we can, like, we're not spending all this time guessing what people will ask and generating these questions in advance and then writing out the answers. Like it's, it's doing this for us. Isn't this great? And then you find now you got to test it. You're sort of back to square one to get, oh, now we got to create a corpus, but not to predict or give the answer just to test it. So you're back to creating that corpus again. Um, and so it's sort of, it, you, you, you thought you got away with it, but then it hooked you back in and you're like, ah, crap. <laughs> I thought I thought we escaped yeah. that. The only point is I think that corpus is much smaller and it, that didn't take very long to create, right? I mean, we had over 20,000 uh-huh. people giving us feedback. Um, and I think, you know, the other things that David mentioned, when you've got your, what I'm gonna call your golden source, then you have your users. And then you have your like ninjas that know the system really well that are trying to break it. Right. And I don't think it's I don't think it's one or the other of those streams. It's all of them. Yes. Right? And by doing that, um, you you create a discipline that ultimately creates really high quality stuff. Yeah, I, I, that makes sense, and I and I hundred percent agree with it. You, it's we've still advanced. It's just not as far as as m- maybe you thought at first glance. But it's less fragile. The system's less fragile as it used to be because it was incredibly fragile. It would break really easily. And you're right. You don't need such a complete corpus anymore. And more importantly, people can now use the system. So you you can create that corpus from real world questions versus some linguist guessing how people might ask things, which they usually don't guess coupon. They guess some some linguistically correct, educated person's view of a complete sentence you know now we have like real world and you and you can and you can gather that and i think and also listen i think there's a lot of philosophy and sort of you know theory in this but i think what's factually true is number one we are giving access you know our old bot had five thousand questions this has five million right number two good point if somebody writes a piece of research within 10 or 15 minutes on a totally new concept that never existed before it just gets indexed and it's available. Right. And then the third, which I think is most important, is we've done, you know, we talk about measuring the future. Well, what's the past? And the truth is humans don't necessarily do great in this in terms of knowledge acquisition using the old tools. And we've quantified, we demonstrated that these new technology, these new techniques are producing significantly higher quality of accuracy than what I would describe as the legacy approaches. So talk about that. You mentioned something earlier uh, to me uh, about measuring against actual humans. Like a lot of people will compare these results to an imaginary person that gives all the right answers. But you guys were like, okay, humans are fallible. LLMs are fallible. Let's compare, like, let's, let's do a real comparison. Yeah, go ahead, David. Why don't you take that one? Yeah. So we did a human versus the AI test and we took about 20 individuals who work in the field, right, with our financial advisor on a regular basis. So already trained, essentially, humans. Oh, these are experts. These are these experts. Are, yep. These are they are experts. And we said, you have one hour to answer about 23 questions and do your best job. And you okay. get access to the historic, like, content search and 10 blue links, right. example, and do your best that- shot. Then, obviously, AI will, will get 
doesn't take an hour, obviously, for the AI. Right, um, right. And let's compare. And we found just, number one, you can't even answer 23 questions an hour sometimes. So there are a lot of times, right. like, people just even finish the test, right? right. And number two, we so, found so that So if they know the answer, they're still lazy, unlike an LLM. So they're, they're now abbreviating answers and cutting corners, which then itself could lead to giving the wrong answer, not because they don't know it, but because they're in a hurry. They're in a hurry. And we wanted, we want, we also asked them like, show us like which links you got, show us what information you had. And that was the part that really stumbled them. Right. Cause Dang. they found like, gosh, even though if I know the information, I can't even find it in this, the database. Right. And that the part of show me where you got the information uh, one. So they can't support hanging. their data. They can't, they can't back it up. They can, they can't, they can't yeah. back it up. Right. And then they just got anxiety. Like, you know, taking a test and getting a time, a, a right. time limit was tough. And and you may not, this may not have been part of it, but I think it's really relevant. Like, did they enjoy that hour? Like, if you did that every day for eight hours, like, is that an enjoyable way to spend your time? Well, that's they... the point. That's the, that's point, the yeah. point, right? Like, not only that, but, you know, we, we, we have another product called Debrief, which essentially, um, with client consent, um, and the advisor obviously choosing to do it, can record the email. And within, you know, five and... minutes of the, five minutes of the meeting, it generates a CRM note and creates an email from, you know, me, hey, you, to Rob, Josh, great meeting. Here's what we talked about. Here's your to-do items. Here's our, to, you know, my to-do items. Have a nice weekend, right? Nobody wants to take notes. I don't care who you yeah. are, right? And and by the way, that's that that's upwards of 45 minutes to an hour of that right. team's time. And again, yeah. that's that's four or five client phone calls right there that they could even do more. So right. you know, again, it's this is everyone's so focused on this dramatic change and everything. Like, I go back to the original po- ho- uh, hypothesis of let's go after the dead space in our lives, right? Let's go after the the non value added task. And there's a lot of it. I think people we've just become so accustomed to doing these things that we no longer think of them as, you know, non value added. Right. Yeah. We're we're in a sense kind of doing them un- unconsciously or subconsciously, so we're not qualify them. We, we just sort of skip that part of our day. It's like breathing. What'd you do today? We don't say breathe, pump my blood, you know? And so, yeah, these tasks, um, one of the folks at, at Google we spoke with uh, called it thunking. You know, there's these thunking tasks that are just brainless that we just do and and we don't think about it. Um, and, and yeah, so therefore we don't, you know, when we recite our day, they're not memorable, but then you look at the clock and you realize like most of your day was thunking. Um, and and kind of to that point, um, the you know, like it's not just that you had you had random people answer. These were your experts, and you're like, is this how your experts want to spend their time answering the same questions over and over again? Um, so, what did you guys learn from the test? Um, number one, uh, the accuracy levels are higher uh, when you use this technology. Number two, the speed to answering is faster. Uh, And number three, we saw a reduction in the three minutes after the use of this bot to the call centers on a meaningful level, right? So people are not having to call call centers, which again, you know, next to maybe taking notes for a meeting or the call centers, probably people's second favorite task, right? So eliminating those types, that type of work. Again, it just goes back to the premise that we were just talking about. Got it. We, we Got spent it. some time on this podcast talking about how, you know, kind of the next phase of, of LLMs, so to speak, isn't necessarily that they'll get better at predicting things, but making kind of a meaningful uh, marriage of, of uh, LLMs and uh, vector databases. Uh, could you talk a bit about the experience of of integrating a relational database and how that open things up for you? Yeah. I mean, first off, when we started this journey, we had no idea what the vector database was. We never even heard that. We, we were so simple. We thought, hey, GPT works really well. Why don't we just take 100,000 documents and copy paste it into GPT? <laughs> right? so we didn't realize that. A lot of people think that. A lot of people think that's yeah. what it's Well, we did. we did. We did. Until we realized it didn't work. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then we went and we learned, well, there's a thing called context windows. These things have memory. You can't just dump all your information into this memory. So this concept of vector databases emerge, which help you take the information, turn them into mathematical representations and make them retrievable. 
right? And so we took all 100,000 documents, we broke them into smaller pieces. And each of these pieces got a math, think of it as almost a GPS coordinate associated with it. And when they stored these into our vector databases, and we thought, okay, we created a vector database. When someone types in the question, you know, what's the outlook on something or what's the procedure, the question will then get turned into a math and we'll look and find the most similar math in the GPS coordinates, give it back to the LM. We thought that worked and that worked okay for certain types of things. It would do mm -hmm. well when comparing the procedural type of questions where there's just one procedure, right? You just have to find one kind of piece of content in this GPS range, call it the size of Iowa, right? Let me tell you where it fell down. It fell down with things like, what's the price target of Amazon? Why? We have hundreds of paragraphs for the past year that reference the price target of Amazon. How would you tell which that one? From it, yeah. Which one to do? So, but that's what vector vectors in themselves do. So we learned that you got to probably create a hybrid approach. And it's as simple as let's go back and let's find all the metadata associated with this content. But then take that and figure out how to apply the metadata as well. So when you get that, what's the price target Bingo. of Amazon? Yeah. You're not only using the vector, but you're also bringing in like a recency boost. Because the reality yeah. is we, we learned quickly, like, does anyone really care the price target from a year ago versus yep. last week? Right. Yep. So you kind of, but, but we didn't learn this until we applied the evaluation yeah. process to tinker. And then we realized we had to apply different values, reran it, put it against yeah. the, the, the golden set, and then understood that there's more than just vectors. Yeah. I, I think this is a really important area we could probably spend a whole episode on this and um but it's um it's the idea i the example i give is if if i took a, a, a the story of hansel and gretel and i dumped it into a vector db and then someone said tell me a good bedtime story for a 10 year old it probably wouldn't bring it up because nowhere in the text does it say this is a bedtime story or a good one for kids or for 10 year olds it just tells the story of Ansel and Gretel. It says once upon a time, blah, 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 blah. And and so without the metadata that would be associated with that content that says this is a kid's story yes. about that's great for kids between the age of blah, 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 you, that would still get lost and it wouldn't come up. Um, and so you need those parameters that you're talking about, uh, like we call them parameters, but that, that metadata um, to also be vectorized uh, in some cases, so that it does come up, and and that it's it's sort of planned out. And and one of the advantages that that we found, I don't know if you guys have found this, but it also means that when that content changes, when the story changes underneath, it doesn't necessarily completely change the performance because if if the knowledge is constantly changing, as we decided earlier, it's it's growing, evolving. Well, then so are your results, right? N now now the content changed the findability changed um so having this like metadata that is more static um and then allowing the content underneath to shift you can kind of maintain you know a little bit more predictability on the findability i, I, I don't know i'm kind of feeding you our answers no, you're right. your answers <laughs> right. the other thing i would say rob though the other thing i would say you know david just talked about um the you know the vectors and we can again you could probably spend an hour just talking about vector databases but the other things that are really important here are um the contact window size right and the oh, bigger yeah, your yeah. contact window everyone's like oh i want a million you know i want a million token contacts I'm like, well you probably don't right it, you'll get lost in yourself right so finding the right context window size and then the other point is like how big are those fragments you know we experimented with 500 tokens, 1,000 tokens, 2,000 tokens, 5,000. Like we we played around. And it, and the challenge is all of these are variables. So you, you kind of have to isolate one, make the change, and then do it over again, and then do it over again, and do yeah. it over again. Yeah. Um, and, and now, obviously, it's less work now because we kind of know what we're doing. But up until then, a lot of experimentation. Yeah. And sometimes that's flexible, right? It's You, you sort of look at the vector distances and then maybe you adjust the context window based on, you know, how many close matches you get versus, and, and to your point, that still can, can mess that's with right. things, um, especially but, if you have content that's out of date. So I, I think this kind of comes full circle. 
no matter what you do on the front end of the retrieval, if your content's out of date and you have conflicting information, none of this is going to work. That's right. That's right. That's right. right. I would just add one more thing about the context window. You know, we find that the bigger context window introduce more latency. And the issue with the right. back of the user experience is you don't really want to sit there and wait like 30 seconds for an answer, right? And right. that's actually been something with us. And cost, right? And we've been very conscious about the latency experience and the team has done a mm-hmm. lot of work. Like we went into the, every pipe and we found every nozzle essentially. It's yeah. like, can we make this and tweak this to be faster while not giving up quality? Yeah, this reminds me of the, the days of, uh, uh, the current days of like, the difference between really good developers and junior developers was how efficient their code ran, how fast it ran. Like that was usually, you know, it's not just could they accomplish things that a junior developer could accomplish, but more like how efficient and effective was it? Did it, you know, did it work efficiently? And I think it's the same idea here is, is the more efficient your, your prompts are, the lower the cost, the faster the response, and the more accurate they are. And that's, it's a, it is an art, but there is a science behind it when you're trying to automate it like you guys are. That's right. I like that this process too that, that you've described uh, has sort of short-circuited that that doom spiral we were talking about at the beginning where, where people were not connected with content as much like you described it. Now you have content authors being notified, when something needs to be updated and it sounds like overall that would trend towards like a, a higher quality of content. And I would assume like a more engaged yeah. user base. Is it, is it a challenge all to, at all to, to kind of keep it, people appraised of, of new tools and developments, or do you feel like, you know, this, this intelligent system assistant is sort of a welcome uh, part of their day that they are kind of eager to, to know about? Yeah, this one's an easy one. Um, because, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll turn, I mean, I know I'm stating the obvious, but who does not want to have instantaneous access to accurate information by the smartest person? I was with Lisa, Lisa Shallot, our, our chief investment officer the other day. And I'm like, you know, we have lots of thousands of advisors and millions of clients, right? Well, you, you have her next to you during a conversation right. with all your, all your clients, right? Now, I mean, it's not her, but it's, it's more of her than you got before. And again, you know, nobody, no financial advisor will tell you that they do search for a living, right? It's not what they, it's not what they want to do. They want to engage clients and solve complex problems. So this has been easy. And by the way, I think, I think our adoption rate, um, on yesterday with one of our members, I think, I think at the team level, we're like 98.5%. Wow. Like nuts. I don't think 98% of our, of our FAs actually use the computer, right? Like, right. So on a relative basis, it's pretty, it's a pretty powerful statement that's amazing um yeah i the elephant in the room for me i and maybe you know i'm underestimating people out there is you know a lot of times people think of software as a project like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna budget a project we're gonna load all our documents all thousand hundred thousand documents into a, a system and then it's all gonna be searchable and and then it'll be done Right. And so how much is that going to cost? Blah, blah, blah. Then we'll have it. This is, this is not a project. This is an ongoing, um, discipline. You need a specific team that's continuously working on it. Um, how did you guys, how did you guys think about that internally? And, and I I mean, yeah, yeah. let let me take that one because, you know, there's, we did our hackathon. I think we had 450 ideas, but Jedi only does five things. It searches for stuff. It summarizes stuff. It evaluates and analyzes stuff. It generates stuff and it translates stuff. And now that we have taken on the search use case and there's other use cases we're working on, our ability to expand that beyond wealth management, because guess what? Everybody in the firm wants to find stuff about anything, right? Now we can take that same underlying infrastructure and turn it to our HR policy, right? We can we can then build because we have established a four one of those four of those five pillars. And I would encourage people to think about those five pillars because what people are going to do is they're going to they're going to build and buy hundreds of generative AI capabilities and not rationalize against those five foundational. Because right. what we're seeing is the reuse 
of those capabilities is pretty powerful. Something that I've never seen before. So I think that, yeah, there's another maybe elephant in the room here, which is that most people think the LLM is the solution. And I think what you guys are pointing out is that's not the solution. That's like having a database and saying that, you know, something like Salesforce or, or some, you know, point solution is a database. The solution is really all of the pieces. The LLM is, is those five things you've mentioned along with search engines and APIs and authentication and, and channel support and a front end UI to access it and, and reports and people and, and people who know what they're, mm-hmm. and we, I always joke with David, we, you know, David X was kind enough. He gave me a, a present when we went live and, and, and it said on the, said on the hat, I teach machines how to learn. And I think we are becoming teachers of machines now. Right. Yeah. And and what, you know, in yeah. our, in our book, we, we kind of talk about how doing this intelligently, even in one part of an organization kind of has the effect of spurring the imagination of, of other parts of the organization. And it, it sounds like you mentioned HR. So, so once, once you can see automation humming and people start to really figure out like how much time it can save them, how much better it can make them at their jobs, there's kind of a thirst for it across the organization. Yeah. If if it's evangelized properly, I suppose. Yeah, I guess it kind of evangelizes itself. Yeah, yeah people I, are really I, excited. I mean, it's not like we're trying to do entitlements or database cleanup, right? Like it, it, the challenge I, is not getting people excited and engaged. It's about putting the right guardrails in place. Yeah. So we're winding down. I want to make sure before we go, we look a little bit forward here. Um, and I, I think the easiest way for me to think about forward is to go like, there's a lot of ways to answer a question. Sometimes it's just text. Sometimes it could be a video. Sometimes it could be an image. Sometimes times a combination of both. But what most is interesting to me and our, in our you know experience is when the answer is an, an interface, a traditional UI like a chart that you can interact with, um, or you know the answer is 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 something like a traditional UI, um, and that gets us into like this eventually not just becoming a place to get knowledge, but to do work. And so now you're saying, hey, what's the price of this? How do I calculate this? How do I, I crop an image and a little image cropper comes up? You don't have to go to Photoshop and look down the menu and go to the right. It's just all there. As you guys think about different ways to answer questions beyond text, um, you know, what does that road look like? Yeah, I mean, I think in theory, everything becomes accessible as the models get better, right? Images. Jeff mentioned debrief, so we're doing things through audio, right? Audio is now being converted to text that's being analyzed. Yeah. There's powerful capabilities with image recognition where it'll recognize an image and not only understand that this has to do with a baseball, but what are the things that you can do with a baseball? But regardless, right. we're all going after the same concept, which is these models we think will become this interactive layer where people can use what they've been born with, which is natural language, and now interact with other machines and other apps mm-hmm. using that. So I think the world of UX will change, right? Yeah. I think the world where we have to teach people the menus and the buttons and the icons, I think there will still be a need for it, but maybe we're creating like a new channel yeah. where natural language just gets you yeah. there and gets it done. One of the other things that is fascinating to me is you guys have built now a foundation of knowledge, right? Where knowledge is retrievable, which is, you know, I think that it was a former the CEO of HP that said, if HP only knew what HP knew, we'd be 10 times as successful as we are or something along those lines. And now you're kind of seeing that to fruition. If, you know, Morgan Stanley is starting to know what Morgan Stanley knows. But now you think about reasoning and machines and your next, you know, foray into like them doing the work themselves. But now you realize that these agents that will get created that can do work will have that knowledge to access so it won't it, they become more autonomous because that's a that's a foundational piece you can't have an agent that's autonomous if it doesn't have access to knowledge it's the same way that you can have a self-driving car without feeding it all of the data of how to drive and where to go and the maps now you guys have built this baseline um, which to me, it seems like it gives you a huge advantage as you go to the next step, which is where these things start doing work. Uh, 
Yeah. One one thing I want to, I think, I think that's right, Rob. And the thing that's starting to occur to me, and it's only like, you can only see what's behind the curtain until you get behind the curtain and you mm-hmm. lose the curtain, right? But what's been so fascinating to me is we live in a world where applications are siloed, right? So I do my accounting in this system and I email in this system and then I translate, like, like we have hundreds of applications here, but what about a world, what about a world where um, you're able to actually access those different components instantaneously, yes. right? Such that you are able to say, I want this thing, which is a translation of a document, and I want this a summarization, and I want this, which is going to look at the risk, and this is going to bring in research. And then I'm going to create an email. I'm going to send it to you. Yeah. And the idea that we're breaking down the barriers, like it's again, people are not asking for this thing because it simply can't exist. Yeah. But in the new world, where almost users are going to create their own apps because yep. they're going to start to bring in knowledge and information and capabilities in real time, in a way that we haven't even thought of. Yeah. In the UX world, we call a lot of that, and and let's categorize this thunking. It's some of the work that we don't realize we're doing because it's like unconscious but moving from app to app to app to app to app to get our work done learning new features of these apps getting these apps to talk to each other cutting and pasting from app to app to get our work done going to see what app um, needs our attention this pogo sticking is hugely time consuming for all we spend so much time it's kind of like developers don't realize that they spend more time reading code than writing code we spend more time pogo sticking between apps than we do actually getting work done. And if that's happening now for us and and we're using micro UIs, so we don't have to navigate into all of these deep, dark corners of our organization and these apps, they're just bringing those micro UIs to the surface. And now our workflow is seamless and we cut all that out. It's amazing how much more efficient we will become. That's right, 100%. Absolutely. Well, this has been great, and I can't wait to to keep talking as as you, you guys are at the front, and and this is all, all going to unfold. And I, I, you know, my impression from what I've seen out there is, this is you barely scratched the surface on the value. Like once we get into the layer of leveraging the knowledge that you guys have now curated, then it gets kind of crazy advantage. Kind of a, a force multiplier of sorts. You know, it's it's funny. So we were listening to Sam Altman the other day, and you know, someone said, you know, where are we? And and he he thinks we're still walking in the dark, right? Yeah. We're still we we when we go back, we'll be like, oh, remember we built the built that vector database, and we got answers. Like, ha ha! Like, how basic <laughs> was that? Right? Yeah. But um, you know, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. And I think it's important for folks to know that you guys worked with Sam Altman and his team as you were going along here. So, um, you know, this, he kind of, he's intimate on what you guys have well, done. Well, yeah. And let me, let me be clear. You know, first of all, David, David, um, certainly a lot smarter than me. And I would say open AI, a lot smarter than us. Right. And I think, you know, to be able to have access to, um, the, the depth of, intellectual capital at that organization. And by the way, they're 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 just a great bunch of men and women yeah. who we, you know, we're we're really excited to be able to work That's with. Awesome. Um just so people understand, what percentage though do you think of the effort was like delivered in the LLM and what percentage was everything around it to make it a solution? If you looked at the the effort and say how much how much did the, the open AI product contribute to the overall solution and how much was the work you guys had to do internally, including the process of people. You want to go, David? I would we say most we of it. Most, we, you, most we, of it. It's most of it. Mo- yeah. Most of it is not the LLM, right? Yeah. And nothing to diminish. It's everything we talked about today, right? And all the way to the approval. Because the thing to remember is when you're out front in, in a heavily regulated industry, right, you, there's a lot of folks you got to get comfortable with new technology and so that yeah. goes pr- pretty much unsaid in many cases yeah so so really the open ai part was making sure you organize the data so that you got the right answers so that you didn't hallucinate um but the rest of it all of the coordination that's just something you gotta do that's right well cool thanks guys for your time this has been fascinating i hope i think a lot of people will We'll learn a lot from this. I really appreciate you guys coming on and being so open. And by the way, last time, 
Last time, guys, I offered you drinks next time you're in New York, so you can come with David and I. And we'll, yeah, bring right. our, we'll bring some of our top, but not front engineers, too. Awesome. awesome. To date. Yes, <laughs> for sure. All right. Well, thanks again for joining this ongoing conversation about conversational AI. Be sure to subscribe to Invisible Machines wherever you get your podcasts. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app. You can also watch these conversations on the Invisible Machines YouTube channel. This podcast is produced for UX Magazine in partnership with OneReach.ai. Over the past five years, our team of nearly 200 engineers, scientists, experienced designers, anthropologists, and linguists have been developing Generative Studio X, an award-winning platform that has the lone distinction of being named a leader by every major analyst group. GSX is a complete environment for hosting, creating, analyzing, and scaling your own digital teammates called Intelligent Digital Workers. For an interactive demo of IDWs in action and to learn more about the GSX platform, head to OneReach.ai. This podcast would not be possible without the hard work and dedication of executive producer Elias Parker and producer Kate Timchenko. Our video and audio editor is Michael Litvinov, and we rely on support from the marketing team at OneReach.ai, including Allison Harshberger, Anastasia Nechtalio, and Vera Pekodko. Thanks again, and we look forward to connecting with you next week, right here on Invisible Machines. <laughs>